Welcome to Lawyerpreneur, where we discuss the alternate paths that allow lawyers to engage their entrepreneurialism and distinguish themselves from others, because being a lawyer doesn't have to mean doing business as usual. I'm your host, Jeremy Richter. Today's episode is brought to you by Alps Insurance, the nation's largest direct writer of lawyers' malpractice insurance. Founded for lawyers by lawyers over 30 years ago, Alps works directly with your firm. No broker or agent. And if you do have a claim, the Alps Claims Handling Team is comprised of actual attorneys, all with private experience. Alps roots for the law firms they protect. They believe in your success and nurture your endeavors with industry-leading coverage, risk management resources, and accredited CLEs, offering practical advice for pioneering lawyers like you. And Alps has the slickest online application out there. Qualifying firms can apply, see rates, and bind coverage in about 20 minutes. Right now, you can get 25% off one CLE seminar from Alps. Go to alpsinsurance.com slash CLE. That's A-L-P-S insurance.com slash CLE and use the promo code lawyerpreneur upon checkout. In addition to the corporate sponsorship that helps pay for the hosting and transcription of the show, you can support Lawyerpreneur on Patreon at patreon.com slash lawyerpreneur. For less than the cost of a point one, you can help pay for the time it takes in creating and editing Lawyerpreneur and receive copies of my two most recent books, Stop Putting Out Fires and Level Up Your Law Practice. Now, on to the interview. My guest today is Robert Dugoni, the internationally best-selling author of more than 20 books. His most recent book, A Cold Trail, was released in February of this year and is doing really well. Welcome to the Lawyerpreneur. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warn you that uh, I have some construction going on at my house where I'm in, uh, you know, confinement, uh, the stay-at-home order. So if you hear little explosions going on in the background, it's it's not fun. <laughs> well, and I'll I'll uh, likewise put a warning in that I'm doing this from my car. It's about 120 degrees in here, um, and so we will we're doing the best we can today, and we're going to chalk this up to example. You know, 674 of learning new flexibility in this brave new world that we're in. Exactly, sheltering in place. I'll tell you. That's right. So so. We're recording this on May 28th. I'm in Birmingham, Alabama. We are not sheltering in place anymore. Things are pretty open right now with some restrictions. But like my law office, for example, I think everybody's back in. We've just brought in our summer associates. So things are really um, busy and everybody seems way more comfortable with that than I am. But, you know, (laughs) we're doing the best. What is uh, what's it looking like for you? You know, we are not yet really open. Um, There are some things open. Uh, I started golfing last year and uh, the the country club has opened again. So, you know, I'm able to at least get out of the house. But here in Seattle, um, most of the businesses that are looking at like June 15th, I think, is when the second phase will uh, will come due. Um, We got hit, uh, as you know, we got hit very hard very early on we were sort of the the center of the of the pandemic uh and and it was actually not far from my house at a retirement center sort of just a few miles from my house so oh wow uh so it it, it's still going to be a while and and we've all my family have adapted and adjusted and um as i've said several times before i really feel more badly for uh the young people um, than for myself. Um, it's just, yeah. it's, it's, it's a whole new world for a lot of them, you know, and no graduations, no senior proms, you know, no accolades. It's just sort of, they're done. And, um, right. so anyway, uh, I cannot complain at all. Uh, I yeah. feel blessed that, um, you know, I, I get to do what I love to do and I, I can walk down the hall to my, my, uh, office, which is normally quiet. And, uh, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm you know grateful for that. Yeah. Um, we've got a five-year-old who's done and a two-year-old, but the five-year-old kind of knows what's going on and the two-year-old doesn't. Um, and you know, he said to my wife just this week, they went on it like a target pickup run where somebody just brought it out to the car. And he said, I'm ready to be for coronavirus to be over so I can go places again. And she just (laughs) felt terrible for him because like, it's been months since he's been anywhere. 
Um, you know, it's been like 10 weeks and he's just ready for something different. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you, you know, you wonder what the world's going to be like for that generation. You know, I mean, you and I are of the generation where you could go through the airport without having to go through any security or screening yeah. and walk right up to the gate and you were good to go. And that, that has changed for forever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you just wonder what, what's going to happen with this whole thing, whether, um, you know, we're going to have to wear masks when we go into public places or movie theaters. And it's, it's just, it's, it still remains to be seen. It's an interesting uh, issue for authors because, you know, are, do you include the pandemic in your next novel? Do you not include it? Uh, I have not included it in the novels I have coming out next year. And I haven't mainly because I've had so many people thank me because they have, uh, been blessed really with um you know being able to have t- their mind taken off everything yeah. you know and well uh, and that's i was listening to a podcast with joanna penn um who is the creative pen and she was saying the same thing that at this point she doesn't have any intentions to write that into her novels because it's just people need an escape and right now she's gonna hold off on it as long as she can yeah i think that i i think i'm gonna do the same thing and that's even transitioned into like what I'm reading, what I in, have intended to read. Like I was going to read um, Bob, Bob Iger's new book that came out recently. He's the CEO of Disney. And I was going to read Cal Newport's The Deep Work. But I have found that when I have time to read, I just want something that that is um, takes me away from everything, even just like analytical self-assessment and just lets me escape to a different world and enjoy a different thing for a while. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I was doing some homework on you. Um, and it seems from what I was reading about you that you knew from an early age that you were a writer and wanted to be a writer. How did that manifest itself in your educational and early career choices? Well, you know, I um, li- literally it was seventh grade when I had to give a speech on slavery and uh, at school. And I just, I, I just, you know, it went really well. And I just really loved uh, the whole experience. And, you know, writing was something that um, writing came easy, easy for me. Writing well doesn't necessarily come easy for anyone. <laughs> sure. But, um, and then, you know, when I got into high school, I, you know, I did what kind of a lot of young men do, which is, you know, try to pursue the uh, athletic career and success on the gridiron and Unfortunately, I wasn't really blessed with the athletic gene. Um, you know, I, I have some some weird factors I've learned as I've gotten older. Uh, you know, like wasn't I wasn't going to be a long distance runner? Let me put it that way. And uh, you know, probably the best advice I got was from a high school basketball coach who told me, you know, I'd make the team, but I probably would never play. And mm. uh, the alternative was that uh, the um, the the head of the uh, newspaper department really wanted me to be the editor-in-chief of the newspaper. And uh, so I had a choice to make, and it really was an easy choice. Uh, And and I chose the newspaper, and I was kind of off and running. I thought I'd be a journalist. Um, Got out of uh, Stanford University, worked for the um, LA Times for a brief period. Um, Was asked to stay, but um, had friends going to law school and was always told as a young man by my parents, you know, get as much education as you can while you're young so you don't have to go back when you have a family, et cetera. So I went to law school and, and um, became a lawyer. And as you know, you know, you, the law is not a job, it's a profession. Mm. And uh, you, don't, you don't go to work nine to five. Uh, yeah. You know, you go to work at seven and at five you get off and that's when you start, you know, trying to find new clients and, and do all those <laughs> other things and you join organizations. Anyway, it's, it's a profession. It's like, it's like being a doctor. You devote your career and your life to it. And, you know, for me, uh, Jeremy, that was just, that was never really my calling. It wasn't really what, what I wanted to do. Um, I enjoyed it. I worked at a, at a, what was a young and up and coming medium sized law firm in San Francisco where everyone was about the same age, you know? So it was like, it was like being in college again. You know, everyone had the same interests, the same uh, ideas about fun. There was just we just had a great time, uh, really a wonderful firm. But in the end, I had one of those epiphanies we all have in life where, you know, I realized I'm not getting any younger. And uh, 
and I'm not I'm not doing what I had set out to do. And so really a number of different factors came into play. But the biggest one was um, I wanted to do what I love to do. And uh, and so I, I left the practice of law and um, started trying to write novels. Was there a transition where you were doing both or was it like you up and quit and decided I'm doing this other thing now? Uh, no, there was a, there was a transition. There wasn't necessarily intended to be a transition, <laughs> <laughs> but but you learn very quickly what you do not know. And even though I could write, I did not know how to write a novel. And so no one really sits you down and says, "Here's how you write a novel." In fact, yeah. even people that go through the MFA programs, they're not necessarily told, "This is how you write a novel." And it wasn't really until I started to realize what I didn't know that I began to understand what I needed to know and I could find the books on the craft that would put me in a place to move forward. And really, um, you know, I always tell people because, you know, I know a lot, a lot of times you'll get uh, young authors or new authors, you know, on your podcast. And so, you know, the big one for me was Christopher Vogler's book, The Writer's Journey. Uh, that was a book that taught me what it, how to create a plot. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, I read Saul Stein's book on writing, which talked about developing characters. And, you know, it was just sort of one thing after another. And um, and once I was able to, you know, to 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 really understand it, you know, like like writing a legal brief, you know, uh, once you sort of understand the format, I was able to then devote my resources to, you know, making my characters and my plots interesting. But but knowing what elements of a story I needed to hit. And um, and so, you know, during that period of time to, you know, to keep my family afloat and all that, I worked part time as a lawyer up here in Seattle where I wasn't licensed. So I couldn't I couldn't be a full time lawyer and I couldn't go into court and do all those things. But I could do a lot of the behind the behind the scenes work for lawyers. Yeah. I could, you know, uh, write briefs for them. I could analyze files for them. I could prepare them for depositions, you know. And, and so I, I made a decent living doing that while I was trying to get my legal career off the ground. And then in 2013, um, you know, I really struck pay dirt. I wrote a book called My Sister's Grave, which I was very blessed to have a publisher at Thomas and Mercer, Amazon Publishing, that really understood the book and understood what I wanted to do and bought it. And it's been uh, I've just been off and running ever since. That's really great. And I can identify with. The difficulty in writing fiction, because at this point I've written three nonfiction books. They're all about law practice and related things. And a couple of years ago, I sat down. I'd had a couple of ideas for novels and sat down to do it and, you know, got 10,000, 15,000 words in. And it was I was really enjoying it. But I was also learning like these are not the same things. And this is so much harder than any nonfiction thing I've ever written. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, there's a lot of balls in the air to juggle and uh, a lot of characters to juggle. And I, you know, I often tell, you know, young writers, I teach uh, writing and I often tell them it's, it's a lot for me anyway. Uh, I don't outline. Um, I'm oh, an wow. organic writer. And so um, it's really more like uh, 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 the way that an impressionist painter would paint. You don't try to write, you know, you don't try to paint uh, one corner of the painting all the way to completion. You really start with the whole canvas and you put down that first layer and then you go back and you put down another layer and a third layer and a fourth layer. And in for me in, in writing, what I mean by that is my first draft is, is uh, nobody gets to read my first draft but me, <laughs> period. And and because I I, I, I live by that. Uh, I'm much more free and open to write anything I want, even though I know as I'm writing it, it's probably not going to make the final draft. Mm. But that, but I don't, I, I tell people, don't, I tell students, don't let, don't let editing get in the way of your creativity in that first draft. Um, you know, you obviously want, it, once you learn story structure and you learn the way a story is supposed to be told and you learn the, the, the beats of a story, um, you can go back and then edit out some of that stuff. And and some of that stuff may become another book. You you just, you never know. So, um, you know, I say 
you know, I say, you know, that first draft, just focus on being creative. And then the second draft, you know, maybe focus on your characters. Um, I'm in the process of writing a story that involves um, uh, a young man in Vietnam. It's not a Vietnam book. It's a coming of age book. But I have, um, you know, multiple scenes which take place in Vietnam. And, um, you know, one of the things I had to come, I had to realize was that I had made him a combat photographer. And yet, you know, after the first few scenes, there wasn't a lot about photography uh, in mm -hmm. the book. And so, you know, one of my last passes through my draft was to just go through and make sure that that thread of combat photography was was finished so that the reader didn't say, wait a minute, I thought he was a combat photographer. You yeah. know, what happened to this? What happened to that? Because readers are really perceptive. So, sure. you know, each dra each draft that you go through, you can you can add a little more and take out a little more. Going back to your journey, was there anything particular that triggered that decision to commit to writing and to pursue the dream and the passion for that, as opposed to, you know, what at that point was probably the easier path of just staying in your legal career? Yeah, you know, I, I, the one thing I can remember, I, and, you know, for what it's worth, I, I can remember getting up one morning and putting my feet on the floor. And I, I was involved in a very difficult case. And I not only was it a difficult case, I had a very difficult client, which every lawyer knows can be really emotionally draining. Yeah. And, um, you know, I put my feet on the floor and, and I just realized, you know, what am, what am I doing here? What am I doing with my life? And, uh, you know, this is not the path I had chosen. How did I get here? You know, getting up every morning and really not being very satisfied or being fulfilled. And, you know, I just, I said to my wife, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from behind me, she said, then we won't. And, you know, that's really all I needed to hear was that it was okay. It would be, a, we would be okay if I wanted to, to go down this other path. You know, and the other the other thing really that happened, uh, Jeremy, was again, I just I was in the shower one morning and, you know, I don't call it whatever you want. But all of a sudden I just I was just in tears. I was just in tears because, you know, I had I had always planned other things for my life and, and I wasn't pursuing that. And I know that there are a lot of people out there that go through these moments in their life and they don't ha they don't get the opportunity. Uh, they're not blessed to be able to do what they want to do. Uh, and, and I understand that. And I think that's why I always give thanks for the fact that I did. I was able to do it. You know, I, I, I'll never forget the time this young man came up to me. He was in one of my classes and he said, I'm a lawyer and I want to do what you do. And I just find really difficult time to, to find time to write. And, you know, like a jackass, I said to him, well, you know, if you really want to do it, you'll find the time. You know, you can get up at mm -hmm. four in the morning like J.K. Rowling and you can write on the train and you can write when you commute. And you can blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me and he said, I have four kids under the age of eight. Wow. And I, I just, you know, it really made me realize that we're not all the same and we're yeah. not all in the same position. And, you know, we can't we can't, you know, all sit there and say, you know. We're going to do this or we're going to do that. Uh, everybody's different. And I, I looked at him and I said, you know, God love you. I said, this is not the right time for you. You, right. you know, you have you you have your your obligation to be a husband, a father. You have Little League. You have basketball. You have plays. You have all these things. And you don't want to miss out on those. You don't want to look back on your life and say, you know, my kids are grown and I, I didn't get to spend any time with them. And I said, here's what you can do. And I gave him a list of five or six um, books on the craft of writing. I said, read these and study these in your free time, in your spare time, before you go to bed, whatever you have, so that when you when your life does settle down a little bit and, and you do have more time, you'll be ready to hit the ground running. Yeah, that's really good that, you know, there are seasons of life where we are able to pursue certain things and others where maybe our own personal dreams have to be put on hold uh, for the sake of our family or, you know whatever events that we're dealing with. Yeah, I think that's really good. All right. I think I saw, or I saw that you started writing novels in 1999. You told us that it wasn't until 2013 that you really had a big break. 
And that's a lot of time. Um, and, and I know that a lot of people think people are overnight successes, but in a lot of interviews that I listen to with authors, they're like, yeah, I'm an overnight success. That was 20 years in the making. Yeah. What did that journey look like for you? Well, there are a couple things to, to keep in mind. One is, I don't know that we know a lot when we're in our twenties. You know, I don't, I don't know that we've had many enough life experiences. So there are, a lot, there are writers out there certainly in their twenties, I guess have been, are very talented, but you know, in my twenties, I didn't know anything. You know, I, I hadn't been mar- married. I got married in my thirties, early thirties. Uh, I didn't have kids. You know, I just, it was a completely different life. Like you said, completely different season. And, um, you know, I think you'll find a lot of writers find success as they get older um, because they can write about things with a certain authority they couldn't write about when they were younger because they had no experience with it. And I'm not saying you have to write what you know. I, I think that's a fallacy. I'm saying you write what you what you can learn, you know, what what, what you can learn and what, what you're interested in learning about. Um I didn't. I I certainly didn't serve in the Vietnam War, but after you know, fifteen first-hand accounts of books that I've read and fifteen movies I've watched and et cetera, I can write. And I have experts. I can write pretty well about you know what happened in the Vietnam War. But but again, um, you know, I, I I don't think I don't think we really know uh, a lot until until we get a little bit older, and so. You know, in, in 1999, I had this idea for a novel. Yeah, but I, I didn't know about story structure. I didn't know about, you know, uh, character development. I didn't know about three acts. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't so know so much that it's it's kind of a fallacy to say, well, I was a writer back then. Um, you know, I was an aspiring writer. And so, um, you know, for me, it was really uh, I look at it. I, I, I look at it as both a blessing and a curse. You know, I had my first book published in 2004. That was a nonfiction book called The Sinai Canary. And it was right up my alley. It was about a trial. It was about, uh, uh, news, you know, required a lot of newspaper skills, etc. And that book hit the Washington Post um, best books of the year. And that got my foot in the door and it got me an agent, a really good agent. And I started writing my novels and, you know, things were sort of underway for me. And I I had, you know, five or six novels out before uh, I got let go by a publisher uh, for a lot of reasons that are really not worth getting yeah. into. But, um, you know, that really pushed me into a corner where I had to sort of reevaluate where I was and what I was doing again, sort of like I did when I was practicing law. And, you know, I, I really took the time to, to take better hold of my, my career. You know, what was it that I did well? And what I did well was I wrote novels. Mm-hmm. And when I, uh, when I got, uh, t- found Thomas and Mercer at Amazon Publishing, um, where they found me, I should say, um, you know, what they said to me was, we think the best thing a, ri- uh, a writer can do is write the next novel and leave the, the promotion to us. And that was music to my ears. Yeah, for sure. You know, and I, I, you know, since 2013, I think I've written 12 books or 13 wow. books, something like that. But it's because I'm doing what I love to do and I'm doing what I'm good at. And I think, I think we can all, as we get older, we can all relate to that. You know, do you want to go out and, and build a barbecue in your backyard or do you want to pay somebody to do it? Well, I could go out and do it and it would look like hell and <laughs> probably not be very good. Or I could pay somebody that does it well. And in the interim, I could write novels, which is what I do well. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it was really finding that sweet spot. And that sweet spot was understanding what I did well and, and focusing my attention uh, on what I do well. Was there a time when you knew that that it was going to work out as a career, that this that writing was going to be something you were able to continue to do and make a living at and take care of yourself and your family? Yeah. You know, I never I never really doubted myself and, and, until I was let go by a publisher. But even then, I, I I wasn't willing to give in. Um, you know, I I'm I'm uh, I'm one of those people that I'm I'm stubborn and I'm a little bit of a pit bull, and I just I was not I was not willing to give up. I, I was not willing to give up, and uh, and I you know I keep going forward. And there's always going to be issues and there's always going to be problems. You know, there's always going to be pirating of your novels. There's always going to be people trying to give away your novel for free. You know, all, all those things have become a potential issue uh, that writers and musicians and other artists have had to deal with. Um, 
But, you know, again, I could sit there and I can worry about all those things, but then I'm not really doing what I love to do, and which is, you know, to write novels. So I, I would say that um, I knew I was going to be able to do it full time uh, and that I was going to be OK when uh, when my sister's grave hit and yeah. uh, I was able to really walk away from the law entirely and just devote my time and my attention to uh, teaching, writing, um, you know, writing novels, teaching, writing, uh, going to conferences, um, doing these kinds of, of um, you know, podcasts and all those things. There's a lot of people who want to be writers and want to be authors that think that all you have to do is write. But you've talked about here how you have the writing, the speaking, you have multiple streams of income. Um, do you enjoy the other aspects, the teaching and speaking, getting in front of people? And it is that fulfilling to you? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do. I enjoy those very much. But but, you know, th that has changed for me, obviously, in these conditions. And so one of the things, you know, one of the things to keep uh, to, to bear in mind is, you know, we're going to be constantly evolving. And, you know, one of the evolutions has been, you know, Zoom conferencing. And so, you know, I'm doing a lot of Zoom conferencing I, um, and uh, book clubs and rotaries and all those things. Um, but I'm not traveling anywhere. And I used to travel, you know, a lot. Um, I used to travel a lot to a lot of different conferences and I had a lot of things planned. You know, I was going to uh, South Dakota this year and, and um, you know, to Texas and to Florida and really all over and everything's come to a halt. And um, while I really enjoy doing those things and I enjoy getting out and meeting people and going to new places and seeing things, I also have to say that, you know, there's been something sort of nice about being able to just, you know, to just be home. Yeah. Uh, home with my wife my kids are home you know they haven't been home in a while and you know they're home and and we're just enjoying each other's company so um, I really enjoy those other things and I hope that we are able to get back to doing them um, because they're it's it's much more satisfying when you do it in person but um, you know what well, time will tell well being home is something that my wife and I've talked about a lot too of, we've got a young family like I mentioned and we're not really ready. We've been really fortunate. I and mean, she's a nurse at the children's hospital here in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And so she's got her job. My job has been fine. And so we're really blessed to be in that position. And, and we've been home with our kids so much more. I've been able to work outside watching the kids play, you know, answering emails and drafting things and all that, that normally I would be stuck in my office for 10 hours a day. And I'm getting all this extra time with the kids and we're not really ready to quite give that up yet. It's been really amazing. Yeah, and I, 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 I hear you. I hear you. And, um, you know, again, I know this has been really a, a tragedy for a lot of families. And so it's, it's something that I hope we pass and we get through. Um, but uh, I haven't I have enjoyed certain aspects of it. Yeah. So you've been really prolific since 2014. What does your daily writing process look like? So I, uh, you know, I'm one of those, uh, I'm one of those OCD lawyers, right? You know, you, you wake up thinking about a case, you think about a case in the shower, <laughs> you think about a case when you get out of the shower. Yeah. Um, yes. When I'm, when I'm writing, when I have a story going and I really like the story, uh, it's hard to keep me away from the typewriter. Um, I will say that I have gotten better about taking weekends off. Mm. Um, I really try not to work at all on the weekends. Uh, I may have a notepad where I, you know, have thoughts come to me and I'll, I'll, I'll note those and things like that. But I really, I really try to keep, uh, keep my weekends free. Um, and, uh, other than that, you know, I go to work every day. Um, you know, I, I, I try to get to my desk early. I'm not going for workouts in the mornings cause I can't. Uh, yeah. So I'm doing online workouts, but you know, I, I put in a good seven, eight hours a day, uh, either working on the novel I'm working on editing the novel that's already, uh, that's already been completed, doing copy edits, doing um, uh, developmental edits, um, you know, answering emails, answering Goodreads questions, uh, doing all, all those things. Um, so it, it's a, it's a full day. I'm, I'm not one of those authors who um, you know, who works two or three hours and then, yeah. and then goes and, and goes to Starbucks. I work every day <laughs> and I, and I put in a full day, which is why really, I think, um, 
you know, I have been able to be prolific. The other thing is I come from a, a background where, you know, you have to learn how to write quickly. Um, as a, as a journalist, you, you need to write succinctly and quickly. Mm. And as a lawyer, you know, there's, there's many times where you get a pleading in that you, you know, you're not expecting. And, and, you know, if it's an ex parte application, for instance, you got to write a response within a couple of hours yeah. and get it back to the court or reply to a, a, an opposition to a motion you know, or whatever it is. And so I, I've, I've learned how to focus my attention and my thoughts. And, um, and when I come in to sit down, I, I'm pretty good about keeping that focus, um, not getting distracted by phone calls, not getting distracted by emails or text messages, um, and, and really just writing. And, you know, I don't have young kids at home right now, you know, so I'm unlike, you know, you and other people, you know, I, I'm not running off to, you know, to Little League or any of those places. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, again, I feel pretty, I, I feel pretty blessed that uh, I get to do what I love. Well, let me ask you this, whether it's writing, whether it's some other endeavor, uh, what advice would you have for lawyers who want to pursue something outside of their practice? And whether it's as, you know, a side hustle that they do adjacent to their law practice or something that they're looking to get out of practice altogether. Yeah. For people looking to do that. You know, you know. I, I would say um, I, I would say uh, the same energy and skills that lawyers put into becoming lawyers can be transferred to other areas. So one of the things that good lawyers are good at is being able to multitask. And because they have to, they have, they don't just have one case, they have, you know, six cases that they're dealing with and they're getting phone calls all the time from on a different case. And then a new case comes in. And, and so what I would say is, you know, do exactly handle, handle whatever that, that thing is that you want to do as you would handle your law practice. And what I mean by that is, you know, plan for it, uh, you know, put together a business plan, put together a, a checklist, put together a, a list of things that, that you want to do. So for instance, if, if you think, you know, I'd, I'd really like to write novels it's something I'd really like to do, but I, I, I don't have the time right now. I have a trial coming up. I have a trial following that. Um, you know, you realize sort of what your limitations are, then, you know, go out and find the books that speak to you that on that teach you, you know, teach the craft of writing this craft of storytelling of plotting of characters and begin to sort of work your way through those. If you have an idea for a novel, you know, begin to jot it down. Um, just, you know, outline it, even if you're not an outliner, because at least that makes you feel like you're sort of pursuing your passion. You're pursuing what you're what you're passionate about. And, you know, lawyers and doctors and uh, you know, a lot of professions out there are filled with people who know what it means to work hard, who know what it means to put in long hours. And and so you just have to understand that. Um, you know, it, it, there's going to be a, a rhythm to this thing, uh, but you don't have to do it all at once. Um, you can plan for it. You know, if you have a partner, uh, your wife or whatever, you know, you can you can sit down together and say, OK, you know, this is what I would like to do. How am I going to make this happen? You know, one of the things that really helped me out was that we when we moved to Seattle to for my so I could pursue this. Well, my, we moved to Seattle because my wife's family, her grandmother had remarried. And she was in her in her 80s. And so her the home uh, that she originally had was basically being rented. It was all paid off. And so I could come up to Seattle and I could live very inexpensively, um, very cheaply. And that gave me the freedom to not feel like I had to I had to have a job right away. Um, you know, my wife made money and we were able to sort of budget. OK, here's what we're doing and here's where I'm at and here's what I'm trying to do. And, you know, uh, here's when I, you know going to get and once you sort of get uh you know you you get a novel written or then you got to find an agent and, you know there's just a lot of different things you can do but I, I know some people that have done a really great job of planning it and uh, and i think that's what what you need to do you need to plan the the, the the stages of the profession that you'd like to be involved in and then take it one step at a time i like that i think that was a really practical helpful answer um all right i've got one more question for you before I let you go. Have you read any books recently that you would recommend? You know, the hard thing for me is I get asked to blurb so many people's books that <laughs> I don't always get to read the book that I want to read. Um, and, and that's, and that's hard. Uh, yeah. Yeah. so, I mean, 
nothing is coming to mind because yeah. for the last six months, I was either reading a book that someone wanted me to blurb or I've been reading books uh, about Vietnam. Uh, <laughs> right. So I, I will tell you that I would tell anyone that hasn't read The Green Mile to go read The Green Mile by Stephen King. If you haven't read Lonesome Dove, uh, um, go read Lonesome Dove. Um, you know, those are some of my favorite books. I just, I, well, I haven't actually read either of those. I just finished The Institute by Stephen King. Okay. And a friend of mine just finished Lonesome Dove and loved it. And I have it sitting on a shelf and have never read it. So oh, you should read it. It's, it's, it's considered by many to be the sort of the quintessential uh, book on the Western. Yeah. Well, and I, when I was researching you, I bought, and it's, it's coming soon. I bought The Extraordinary Life of Sam Hill and because that seemed like a book that's just right up my alley. And I'm really excited to read that as soon as I finish a book that I'm reading um, for a podcast interview that's coming up. Well, I, I, I appreciate it. Sam Hell is a book from my heart and uh, it's touched it's touched so many people on so many levels. It's, it's really um, it's really heartwarming. You know, I've done seven Zoom conferences this month and they've all been book clubs that read Sam Hell. Oh, wow. And I got another one next Monday. So I will end up doing eight. And it's all about Sam Hell. Um, well, Sam Hell is a literary novel about a young man born with ocular albinism who is struggling to lead a normal life um, while he's being bullied, etc. Ocular albinism is he's born with red eyes. He's got a red, you know, uh, he, red eyes. Anyway, um, and so so many people can identify with that. So many people have been, you know, the victims of of uh, bullying or or you know, all, we all have our crosses to bear. And um, so many people have had to deal with that. So um, it's really been a, it's really been a heartwarming experience for me. And that's why I'm writing this next book, uh, this Vietnam book that I'm working on. It's really a, com a coming of age book, sort of like Sam Hell was a coming of age book. Well, my favorite stories, especially movies, are coming of age stories. So I'm sure I'll be right in line for that one, too. Uh, I hope um, so. All right. If people want to follow you, connect with you, where's the best place to do that? You know, I have a website, bob at robertdagoni.com, and you can sign up for my newsletter on there. I, I won't uh, spam you. I only get out a couple <laughs> newsletters a year. Usually when some big news comes, like when I sell things to L.A., to Hollywood and those kind of things. Um, and other than that, I'm on Facebook. I think it's at Robert Dagoni, and I'm on Twitter. Um, so I'm on sort of the, the normal social media channels. And um, I will tell you that on Facebook and Twitter, I am not political. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't get into a lot of that stuff. I literally sort of just keep it lighthearted. And um, are you sure you're doing it right? I'm not. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I there, uh, there's a, you know, there's, a, there's enough anxiety in the world, and there's enough yeah. things to have to worry about, and to get into fights with people you don't know, and and are and are faceless and often nameless on uh, on the internet i just i to me i just don't find it productive absolutely i totally agree uh my twitter feed is mostly writing stuff lawyers that i know or am interested in and sports so i can totally identify with that yeah and i'm that's yeah, i'm right with you well i really appreciate your time thanks for coming on the show my pleasure thank you thank you for having me i i uh i i've been down to your state a couple times uh for book festivals and i enjoyed it very much well hopefully we can all travel again soon maybe you can make it back this way that would be great if i do I'll, I'll let you know gladly great if you've enjoyed the show you can support it by rating it on apple podcasts or wherever it is you're listening and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything you can also support the show on patreon at patreon.com slash lawyerpreneur thanks for listening